job this morning, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, Miss Danny, Miss Lori, just a beautiful, beautiful job today. Uh, out of my element, I've already preached once by now, so uh, the one service is uh, unique. I believe there's some people here, before we get into the vision, I believe there's some people here that that maybe you have some anxiety on some things. Uh, there's many things going on in the world, um, and we understand that, and if you're watching the news, uh, and I don't care which side of the news you're watching, and uh, and maybe you're watching social media, and, 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 and maybe you're, you're watching the 6,941 videos that hit your inbox every four minutes, but... Uh, I want to pray for you for peace because the scripture tells me that God gives peace that passes understanding and I don't know about you but there came a point in my life where God filled that void in my heart that was that part where you know the anxiety still comes but that part where you're you're afraid of everything oh no well what about COVID what about well what well what about it if it's my time to die there's an airplane going to land on my head or something so reality says we can have peace through Christ. So I want to pray this morning. If that's you, just pray with me. Uh, Father, we come to you right now. Lord, you promised peace. That's your promise to your people. I'm not asking you to give them all a Cadillac. Uh, I'm not asking for a Mercedes. I'm asking for what you promised. You said your peace you would leave. Now, I understand that we need to focus our mind on you, and I'm asking you that they do that. But I'm asking you right now, before they leave this place today, that they would have peace and not focus on the negative. You have everything under control. And whether things go our way or another way, your way is the best way. And we trust you with everything. So give peace that passes all understanding in your precious and holy name. Amen. Give him praise one more time. Uh, last week we talked about the plumb line. We're running a little bit late today. That's okay because I'm going to preach another hour anyway, right? Uh, we talked about the plumb line. Everybody ready? Everybody ready to line up with God? Amen. Uh, yeah, some of us anyway, right? Um, if you saw the banner when you came in, the banner says on it, it says, uh, the sky is the limit or is it? The sky is the limit or is it? It'll probably pop up on the screen here in a moment. The sky is the limit or is it? Uh, and the question is, is the sky the limit or is it? Then you have a pen in your hand. Hopefully everybody got a pen when you came in. Everybody get a pen? If not, we have them at the door. We have a card back there for you to sign too for Miss Donnie before you leave and cake in the back. But on the pen it says, imagine greater... A limitless God. Imagine greater limitless God. And so what I want to do today is talk to you about uh, a limitless God and imagining greater. And in order to do that, B.L. Kelly told me, he was a mentor of mine, he told me that you always begin with the end in mind. You always begin with the end in mind. So to begin with the end in mind, I want to start at the end and work our way forward. Is that all right? I want to start at the end and work our way forward. So the question is, the sky is the limit. The sky is the limit, or is it? Ephesians 3.20 tells me this. Ephesians 3.20, my favorite verse of all time, says, To him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all I can think or ask, according to the power that works within me. To him that is able, God, to do exceedingly abundantly above all I can think or ask according to the power that works within me. Now we serve a God that is limitless, right? He can do exceedingly abundantly above all I can think or ask. But here's the question. How much is exceedingly abundantly above? Well, nobody knows, but he puts a qualifier in there, right? What is the qualifier? Exceedingly abundantly above all I can think or ask. Some translators use this word, imagination. So for think or ask, they use the word imagination. So he can do exceedingly abundantly above all I can 
imagine. Now, what is my imagination? Well, my imagination runs wild. I'm the guy that goes out and sees a junk car somewhere and goes, oh, wow, look at that. And other people go, look at what, right? And I'm like, look at what it can be because I can see what it can be, not what it is. Every day I go by my car that's sitting on a trailer at my house. It's a 1937 Plymouth. I call it Patmore uh, from the Downton Abbey series. It's a little short, uh, chubby car, you know, and I call it Patmore because it's, it's just cool looking and, uh, and, and probably is going to have a lot of attitude, at least I hope. But I see what it will be someday. And the reality of that is, when I look at what God's going to do and see things, I need to understand that He's limitless. Now, what does it mean to be limitless? Well, let's look at that for a minute. The verse qualifies it with, the limit is of what I can imagine. So, the limit is, God can do exceedingly above all I can imagine according to the power that works within me. The word power is dunamis in the Greek language. It is a dunamis power or an inherited power, an inherent power that has been delivered to me through God, an inherent power. So, if I read that verse and I understand that verse, it kind of says this. It says, God will be as big as I will let him be. So, the only limit that God has is the limits that I place on him. And the limits that I place on him sometimes are tradition, or fear, or anxiety, or, or even the associations that I'm around. And they limit the places that I put God in. You go, now, well, how can you limit God? Well, it's pretty simple, actually. If God says, I can do anything, and you go, okay, well, God can do anything but. We, put a, we add a but to whatever God can do. We add a limit to. Or what about this one? Well, I've never seen anybody healed from this. So the doctor said and the doctor knows. So therefore, right, it automatically, we begin to believe whatever the doctor said. We begin to believe whatever the politician says or whatever the news says or whatever the world says. And all of a sudden we begin to put limits on God by what we have either been trained or associated with. And our imagination only goes so far. So God does exceedingly abundantly above, but it's at a limit. You still with me? Exceedingly abundantly above. All that I can think or ask. Think or ask means to ask, desire, comprehend. One translator calls it imagine. So the sky isn't the limit, the limit of what God will do. And it literally is the limit of what I will allow God to do. So let's look at what God's limits actually are. What is God's limits? Paul was in a shipwreck and here's what Paul said. Paul said to the people on the ship. Now imagine this, this isn't a modern day ship. But Paul said to the people on the ship, God said it's going to be okay. Nobody's going to die. They're in the middle of a storm back in the, in the days when ships weren't the way they are now. He said everything's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. And not one person died. Now that's a pretty big God that can protect them in those days. Right? That's a pretty big God that can protect them in the days of those things. I think about this one. A den full of hungry lions. We got some hunters in the room. And I tell you right now, if a mountain lion or a bobcat or something gets after me, I, I know that he's hungry and he wants to eat. That's the nature of the lion. But God put allowed Daniel to be in a lion's den. And for some reason, these lions, out of every lion on planet Earth, God made these lions vegetarians for the night. Right? All they want was lettuce. For, because God is limitless. God is limitless. God takes a fiery furnace that is so hot that the men that are feeding the furnace die from the heat. And he throws three of his children into the furnace. And when they look into the furnace the next day, they not only see three men walking around in the furnace because of the limitlessness of God, but they see Jesus walking in the furnace. And he's not been born yet. And he's not going to be born for hundreds of years. Yet they know who he is and that he's already there. If he can do these things, what about this one? No two snowflakes ever the same. Create a universe in record time. Aren't you glad it wasn't like Edison and the light bulb? Thousands and thousands of tries. Have you ever seen the movie The Current War? 
When, when Benedict Cumberbatch is telling about it, he says the first time it went past like two minutes, we're like, oh, and then ten, and we're like, oh, he said, and when it got up to hours, we're just sitting there bumfuzzled because we don't know what to do. One's never burned that long before. And God said, let there be light. Bam! There it is. There's no limits to God. What about this one? They say there's 113 billion people. I talked to some of our leadership the other night. There's been 113 billion people on earth. But let's say that some people conservatively say only 105 billion people that had ever lived on planet earth. 113 to 105 billion people that have lived on planet earth. Not two have ever had the same DNA and he started with dirt. That's it. This is coffee grounds, by the way, but because uh, I forgot my dirt at the house this morning. But, uh, and, and a little bit of creamer in there with it. But the, so it, it looks a little messed up. But, uh, and I just like the smell of the creamer. Um, I miss creamer. A uh, hundred and thirteen billion people. Do you know how many that is? That's more money than big money Nelson has. That's saying a lot. That's more money than Jim Nelson has is a hundred and thirteen billion. And he took one scoop. I figure God went like this from the dust of the earth, maybe about that much, and he created man, and the Bible says that from Eve, it's the mother of all living, so every person on planet earth is birthed from Eve, every color, race, creed is birthed from Eve, and the scripture tells me that they literally, uh, that, that everyone is birthed from that, science tells me there's been about 113 billion people, conservatively 105 billion, and God has never made the second DNA or the same DNA twice. Why am I worried about my little problem and him not being able to handle it? What am I going to do in America? What am I going to do? I'm going to get up in the morning and praise my God. Because he's limitless. There are no limits to our God. Are you getting it? You get that? So the limit is not the sky. The limits is what I place on him through my fears, through my training, through my association. When my dad died, when he, before he died, he's in the hospital and the guy comes in and I'm praying for healing. And I'm using the, the verse in Jeremiah says, I'm the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And I'm saying, no, there's nothing too hard for you, Lord. And the guy comes in and says, when you've been a Christian longer, son, you'll understand. You'll get past all that faith thing. I said, get out! Amen. You say, but your dad died. Yeah, well, that's true. It's appointed unto man to die. But my faith's better now than it's ever been. According to the power, the inherent power of God that works within me. Now imagine this. The God that created the universe lives inside of me. He lives inside of you if you're a born again child of God. He lives inside of you if you're a born again child of God. Now we live in a terrible world and we understand that things are horrible out there. But if all I can do is focus on that, if all I can do is buy what the enemy's pitching, and I can't imagine any greater than that, I'm going to get what I'm imagining. Amen. That's it. That's all I'm ever going to have is what I can see before me. If I can't learn to see beyond that to the limitlessness of God, if he can create the earth in world record time... If he can, if Joshua can be fighting a battle and Joshua look up at God and say, hey, I need a little more time to fight this battle. And I, you know, picture this. I know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of one of those weird guys that kind of brings it into modern day, but I'm like God in modern day 2021, right? Uh, so uh, what are you asking of me? How about if I just turn some lights on? 
No, God would have said it something like this. So you're wanting me to take the earth that's been spinning for over 6,000 years in a perfect axis, and you want me to stop it? You want me to mess up everything in the universe? You want me to put a leap year in there somewhere so that I can confuse scientists from now on so that you, one person, can win a battle? Yes, Lord, that's kind of what I'm asking. You got it. Because if you got the faith to ask for it, I got the faith to do it in accordance to you're doing it for my good, not your good. You say, you sure it happened like that? You can't prove it any different. Science doesn't know why there's a longer day. And, and the Bible proves out that Joshua said, sun stand still. And God said, you got it. Done. So we know that God's limitless. Let me take you to part two. Imagine greater. And I've probably been preaching this for the eight years that I've been here. And I, I believe that God has brought it all together. And I want you to get it this year. If you don't ever get it, if you haven't got it, get it this year. Because i got to be honest, I'm tired of preaching it. <laughs> no, listen, I'm preaching to myself too. Judges chapter 6, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Midian for seven years. Well, that don't sound right. Well, it happens. You do bad, you get bad things. Skip down to verse 6 with me for the sake of time. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites... That the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drave them out from before you, and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God, fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice." And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which is in Oprah and that pertained unto Joash, the, uh, that guy Abazarite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide from the Midianites. Father, bless the remainder of this service in your precious name. God tells them how good he's been to them, but that they still wouldn't obey him. This is where I believe it gets real good. And the angel of the Lord, verse 12, appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, mighty man of valor. He tells Gideon, now the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord is speaking to Gideon, and he says, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. That's the first thing he calls him. Uh, Gibor Shayil, uh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. That's what the angel calls him. A mighty man of force, a man of valor, a man of strength, a man of efficiency, efficiency, wealth, an army, even brave. He calls him an army. And he literally says to Gideon, You are a mighty man. You are a mighty man. Can I just say this to somebody in the room? You need to stop hearing what the enemy has said about you because God has called you somebody mighty. And the enemy has convinced you that you're nobody, that you're nothing, that you're not worthy to be used by God, that you're not good enough, and he's a liar and the truth is not in him. Mm, let me go on. i got to be good, and I ain't going to be good. Listen to Gideon's response. If the Lord be with us, then why is it all of this stuff is happening? Why is this befallen us? And where are the miracles which our father told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. God sent an angel to call Gideon mighty warrior. And Gideon ignored it completely. He didn't even listen to what the angel said to him. And I thought, man, if I was Gideon, I'd hear that, right? Wrong. How many times have I not listened to what God told me? Oh, I can tell you the stage used to be right there. But I was laying in the floor when Brother Marshall prayed over me. Actually, I was standing when he started praying. And I'm laying there and the Holy Ghost is telling me what he's going to do through me. And I'm sitting here going, Lord, that's not, I'm not worthy. And I wish the Holy Ghost would have just reached up and slapped me and said, shut up. I'm sick of hearing it. He didn't, he was kind, but he said the same thing. 
But here's what Gideon, Gideon ignored what God, how many times do we ignore when God says, you're a royal priesthood, you're of royal blood, you're somebody special, I got big things for you. Oh, well, but, well, why am I in the mess I'm in then? Well, why is this going on? Well, why is that going on? Now listen to what happened. Gideon starts complaining. He ignores completely what God said to him. And he starts complaining. And now it says something crazy. You go back and read this in your own Bible. Read this in your own Bible. Because up till now it said, And the angel of the Lord spoke to Gideon. And the very next verse says, And Jehovah spoke. Now picture this. God's got an angel talking for him, like a preacher, a messenger standing up talking. And then all of a sudden, God spoke. That's what your Bible says. Your Bible says it's all caps, L-O-R-D, Lord, in all caps. It says Jehovah. It means Jehovah. Jehovah spoke to Gideon. God, he says, and the Lord said. Let me get back there. I lost it. Go in your might. Your human strength is what the word means. And you will save Israel from the hands of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? Gideon ignored the mighty warrior part. He in fact said contrary, contrary, contrary Lord. It's not true to a limitless God. He just said it won't work. It won't work. It's, I wouldn't. Be. And now Jehovah said I want you to go in your own strength. And I want you to save Israel. And here's Gideon's response. Not so, Lord. Where can I save him, Israel? I'm too poor. I'm too weak. I'm the run of the litter. I'm the least of my family. I'm nobody. I'm nothing. We will never imagine greater until we believe what God said about us instead of what the world says about us. We will never believe God to be limitless in our life as long as we believe what the world has taught us to believe of ourselves. God did not say to Gideon, I'm going to empower you, although later he does say, I will be with you and empower you. But at this very moment in time, the Lord says to Gideon, I'm going to show you who you are in me. And I will never imagine what all God can do, not for me, but through me, if I can never imagine who I am to him. What's the very first temptation of Christ? Now listen, Matthew chapter 4. Listen to what Satan says. If you be the son of God. The very first temptation was, are you sure you're the Messiah? You just questioned Jesus? I mean, I know he's fasted 40 days. I know he's hungry. I know he's tired. But you really didn't just do this, did you? I mean, you can test me, but not Jesus. If you be the Son of God. That's the first temptation right there. We love to talk about the three big ones, but the truth is, Satan wanted him to question who he was. God sent an angel to tell him he's a mighty warrior. And he said, well, if I really was, you know what would happen? I wouldn't be where I'm at. Really? Really? I've only failed once this morning that I know of. And here I am preaching. That I know of, I've only made one mistake, Kenny. Only one that I know of this morning. Almost two. But it's early in the day. I've got time. <laughs> Church, if I cannot learn to believe what God said about me, 
I'll never get where God wants me to go. If I can't imagine greater of the God that lives in me, the story goes on. Gideon says to the Lord, Jehovah, I'm too poor. I'm too weak. How many times have we said this about ministry? Well, if God would just give me the money, I could do it. Ever heard the story of the Dallas Theological Seminary? It was closing down. And they were sitting around the room. And they were praying about what to do next when they were going to close the doors. And one man at the end said, you know what? My dad owns a cattle of a thousand hills. I'm going to pray that he sells some cattle. And about a week and a half, two weeks later, a man came by and said, I'm not a Christian. I don't know what's going on, but I'm out in the field. And a voice spoke to me and said, sell some cows and give the money to this place. I have no clue because I got millions and millions and millions. But here's some money. And it, the place kept on going. Because God does not need us in our own whatever it is that we think we need to be. What He needs us to be is what we hear Him say we are. Yeah, thank you. Amen. Somebody buys it. Glory. And I'm going to prove it to you in just a second. And I'm, I'm hurrying, I promise. Gideon says, I'm the littlest of the bunch. I'm the weakest of the family. We ain't got no money. My family ain't nothing. And God said, I'm going to show you. I'm going to prove to you. And I'm going to go with you. And if you go on down through that scripture, and I, I'm not going to read it all, but if you went to verse 34, he said, The Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew the trumpet, and he gathered. Verse 36 says, We find Gideon once again saying to God, If you're going to save Israel, let me lay out a fleece. And you know, we love to talk about the fleeces before God, and I think that's a biblical thing. But do you know what that was more about than, than Gideon fleecing God? It was more about God proving himself to Gideon. Because even though God had proven himself over and over and over and over and over to Gideon, he still needed a fleece. He still needed a fleece. He still needed a fleece. And then he had to turn around and, and, and let him hear somebody talking about down in the camp even. Gideon still didn't believe. Imagine greater. Think about this. What is it that is greater than your God? The sky is not the limit. He's limitless. He can do anything. He can do anything. What can you believe Him for? Because He can do exceedingly abundantly above all you can imagine according to the dunamis inherent power, inherent power that works in you which means you've got to let Him work in you this power. And I'm not talking about crazy, but I'm talking about God. What did he say about you? You're a royal priesthood. You're a priest. You're a priest. Men, you're a priest to your household. You're a priest to your household. Ladies, if there's not a man in your house, you're the priest of your household. Oh no, now he's doing that gender thing. Stop. Be the men and women that God called you to be. That's royal blood. If you're a born-again child of God, that's royal blood in your veins. Now, I'm not telling you to run out and start taking a ball back to every heathen out there. That's not what he said. Everything we do, we do in love. And if we don't do it in love, then it's not of God. That's according to his word. But he says, I'm his child. Do you know what that does? That frees me to be his child. That frees me to believe that my dad's going to take care of me. When my kids need something, I just find a way. I just find a way. He calls you blessed. He calls you friend. He calls you mighty warrior. The enemy says things like, well, why is this happening? If God really was there, why would this happen? Where's God now? You think God could use you? You'll never be good enough. You'll never be a pastor. You'll never be a teacher. You'll never be a leader. What if you took this year and imagined greater than you've ever imagined? 
Thursday night. We brought some leaders together here. Isn't that beautiful, watching them? I love babies. I love them. People go, why do they let them babies run around? Because I'd rather see babies run in a church any day of the week than to see a church with no babies. Because right now she's hearing the word of God spoken into her life. You keep bringing her and you keep letting her run. It'll be all right. Thursday night, brought some leaders together. I thought, man, they're going to think this is silly. Talking about imagine greater. What is that for a vision? But I asked them, tell me something. Tell me something that is greater for your department. Tell me something that is greater for your department. What can you see that would be greater for your department this year? What can you see that would be greater? Miss Kathy, what can you see for the worship team? And she said, I'd like to see a full band. And then she lights up and she says, with a saxophone. Because I like a saxophone and I'm thinking, gosh, how good would that be, right? What about an interactive children's church where all these kids that run around with a tablet in their hand right now that we're trying to, to handle with, with, with the coloring pages and things that we did as a kid. What about now if, if we, uh, and, we're, and we're looking into it at this very time at making it interactive where they can all have a tablet in their hand. And they can answer the questions on screen and they can be plugged in and they can get and they can get attached because they're carrying a tablet around anyway. Right. And now we can get them plugged in where they'll want to be in church and they'll want to learn. But now they're not just learning what the world wants them to learn. We're going to teach them God's word and get them plugged in. What about interactive like that? Well, how are you going to do that? Uh, Well, where's the money going to come from? God. He's limitless. Micah, what do you want for the youth department? There's only two or three of them right now. I want a youth center. I want a youth center out back. And then someone else speaks up and says, well, have you thought about other properties too? I'm thinking, see, that's imagining greater. You got two or three youth and you're thinking about building a youth center? Now, I know the negative mind says, well, where are we going to get the money? You're going to bring bottles and cans, and God's going to make the price of aluminum go up. And the next thing you know, it's going to be built because God is that big of a God. What does the elders want? Prayer meetings. Where it's not three people in a church, but where it's people laying and weeping before the Lord and crying out. For their nation and their country. Pastor, what do you want? I want a new parking lot. With lights. And cameras. Can you imagine it? For those of you online that didn't get to hear that, that saxophone was jamming in behind those pictures because you can't play the music online. That was for you. Because, see, I'm imagining God doing well, everybody else says, can we get through this? Or, or we've done the seven-day trial of, of 2021, and we don't want to buy the, the full version. And all I'm thinking is, my God's bigger than that. My God's bigger than that. My God's bigger than that. While everybody's saying, oh, I'm just trying to get through. My God's bigger than that. My God's bigger than that. My God's bigger than that. I can go to bed tonight with peace in my heart because my God's bigger than that. And your God is bigger than that. And it starts with you believing he's going to use you he's 
going to use you. He's going to use me. After Brother Marshall gave me that prophecy over my life that God was going to use me from Deuteronomy chapter 8 to reach the north, south, east, and west of the Pacific Northwest, I said, that's crazy. I'm a pastor in a town of 9,000. Shortly after that, I got a call from the overseer about the church in Corvallis going to close. And I know it created some rift. Some people didn't want no part of that in this church. And after three years and some struggle and some people even giving up along the way, there's a thriving church in Corvallis that you, you, because we trusted God, even though there was opposition, we trusted God. And there's a thriving church there today that was going to close and sell the property. And all I'm thinking is, if God can save a church through a little run like me, what kind of plans can he have for a group like this? But we've got to imagine greater. I'm about to close. Gosh, I've been preaching forever. I'm used to preaching twice or three times. Last story I'll tell, and I'm going to invite you to pray and ask God to expand. Zechariah 4, I shared with you last week. Zechariah 4 is the story of Zerubbabel. And the scripture says that he showed him the, the two olive branches and they were the two trees and they were feeding the lampstand with pipes and there was a continual oil and he said he didn't understand what it was. He said, but I'm going to pour out my spirit where you don't need the priest to feed you anymore. The Holy Ghost is going to feed you. The Holy Ghost is going to pour into you so that everything you need will be accomplished. Everything you need will be accomplished through the Holy Spirit of God. Through you. Through you. And by the way, let me make this clear. I've said it about four times today. It's not about what He'll do for you. It's what He'll do through you. For you comes through you. It, what He does for you it, it, it will be there once He starts working through you. The greatest blessing He'll ever do for you is what He does through you. And then in the book of Joel, when it carries over to Acts chapter 2, he says, In the last days I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. See, God's not going to make you do this thing alone. The Holy Spirit is going to get you there. But he can't take you beyond where you're willing to go. So you, the limits of God, and the scripture plainly tells us there are no limits except the limits we place on him. What limits is that? That's up to you. The vision for this year is imagine greater. He's a limitless God. Imagine greater. When COVID started and they talked about how much fear there was involved and you've had it and you had a nasty case, you ended up having a heart surgery because of it. I got so scared. Man, I listened to every word. And now I read the report every single day from, because I get it every day. And I almost chuckle every day. Not because of the death and the, and the sickness. But because I let it almost kill me. The anxiety of it almost got me. I sat at home. Gained 30 pounds. It wasn't COVID-19. It was COVID-30, right? Somebody said 50. I sat at home afraid to go anywhere or do anything. And now every day, whether I got anything to do or not, I get up and go. I come down here and meet people, if nothing else. You know why? Because I'm, if God's time for me to go is now, it'll go no matter what. And if I'm going to get COVID, I'm going to get it. But I refuse to let the enemy Steal what God has for me because of fear, because of anxiety, because of tradition, or because of what I've been taught along the way that God's limited. Because the Holy Spirit of God wants to take you beyond the limits. And again, I'm not speaking some goofy out there, and I'm not adding scripture to something that it doesn't belong to. 
I believe with everything in me from the Old Testament to the New, the Holy Spirit of God is being poured out on his people to reach a lost and dying world. We're going to change a bunch of stuff this year. Wednesday nights at 6.30, you can come in here and worship. It's going to be canned music for 30 minutes before Bible study. You can come in here and dance and run and shout and hoop and holler and then sit down and we'll study the Word together. The fourth Wednesday night of the month, we're going to bring snacks. We're going to divide up. Hopefully some of you guys will teach men in there, women in here, or vice versa. And then we're going to bring food once a month. And we're going to bring canned foods. And we're going to take it to a family in the community and feed a family. We're going to do everything we can this year if God has an imagination. But now let me say this. Don't come and tell me what we need to be doing because I'm going to put you to it. (laughs) Next week I'm going to ask a different deacon to lead the offering. First of all, if you don't know Christ, you need to imagine greater because the enemy's told you for whatever reason. Second of all, If guilt or fear or whatever it is has held you back. If believing for the least possible amount has been your M.O. It's time to wash your hands of that garbage. If he can do exceedingly abundantly above all I can imagine. I'm going to put an imagination out there that's going to stretch his limits. All my kids are going to be saved. My grandkids I don't have are going to be saved. My neighbors are going to be saved. Pat Moore's going to be the coolest 37 Plymouth on planet Earth. And if not, that's cool too. God will work within the realm that we place him in. And it's time that we give him a bigger realm to work in. Because he's a bigger God than the small area that we've put him in. It's time to imagine greater. If that's you today, if you feel like there's, there's somewhere that God wants you to do, maybe there's some, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not even going to do it that way. Let me just do it like this. Stand with me. If you want to believe God for more, whatever that is, salvation, whether that's for your family, I don't have to lay hands on you, but if that's you, if you just want to believe him more for something, just get out. Come on. Come up here and stand. Let's pray together. Come on. We're not going to take long. I know it's late. I know it's late. Come on. Hurry. It's 1125. Lord, don't don't worry. The restaurants are closed anyway. (laughs) And if you don't have food, I got some roast at my house. Ain't much, but we'll split it up. Come on. Hurry. Come on. If that's you. I know there's more people that believe in God for something, but we're going to believe him for more. We're going to imagine greater. For those of you that God has called into ministry, if you feel like you're supposed to lay hands on somebody, you do that now. Father, in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, I want to repent. I want to repent that we have not That we have placed you in a box and that we have not believed when you've called us mighty warriors. That we have not believed you when you've said that we are a royal priesthood. That we have not believed you when you've said that we are a chosen generation. God, I want to repent that we have not walked in all that you have given us in peace and joy and authority. And today I pray that you loose an imagination in us to believe for more, for more, for more than we ever have, for greater, that the sun would stand still, that we could win the battles that are before us through the anointing of your sweet Holy Ghost. I pray for every man, woman, and child in this building and in this room. I pray for ministries that have been stifled, Ministries that have been put on hold, I pray that they be loosed. I pray that you give us wisdom and knowledge to know when to go and where to go and what to do. 
I pray that you give us freedom and liberty. I pray that you give us boldness to be who you called us to be. You said when you poured out your spirit that we would have boldness to be witnesses. So God, in this last day, rather than to be whiners, let us be witnesses. Rather than to complain about what is going on, let us cry out to the God that can change it. And Lord, not our will be done, but thy will be done. Father, I want to thank you for the band and the saxophone. And for the children's department that is top notch and top rate. And for the new teachers that are going to help. And I want to thank you for the youth center. I don't know how you're going to do it. I'm just believing you for it. And I want to thank you for the help. And I want to thank you for prayer meetings that shake the foundations and worship that rattles the walls and that moves the kingdom, Lord. I want to thank you for parking lots and buildings and whatever we need, dear God, to move forward for you. I want to thank you in advance for all that we need to move your kingdom forward. I want to thank you for an imagination beyond where we've ever been. Let this year be our year. That we don't need to fleece you. That we just trust you. In your precious and holy name. Amen and amen. Give him praise in the house. I'm going to close with this. This is not just a word. This is not just, oh, preacher preached today. Woo! No, take this home. Write it on something. Every time you pick up the pen, imagine greater. When you pray tonight, when you go to bed, stop after you prayed and go, God, what could I have prayed bigger than what I just prayed? What could I imagine greater than I just prayed for? If that is you prayed for your kids to be saved, then stop and say, I prayed for them to be saved, Lord, filled with the Holy Ghost and working for you. And then stop and go, okay, Lord, I pray for them to be healed, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, working for you, moving for the kingdom, blessed. I mean, because greater, greater, greater. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Have a blessed and wonderful day. Whew. I'm done. Over and out.